Usually when people think of camouflage, they think of a bunch of guys wearing clothes with splotchy green patterns on them. But it's so much more than that. Properly camouflaging a person or an object requires a thorough understanding of, and properly exploiting, a number of factors like shape, lighting, shadows, and how the human brain perceives patterns and movement. So today, I want to talk about camouflage. In this video, I'm going to go over a brief history of camouflage, the principles of camouflage, infantry, land vehicle, naval, and aircraft camouflage. So let's start by speed running through the history of camouflages. Because for thousands of years, hand-to-hand -hand combat was the primary method of fighting, having infantry being able to recognize each other with distinct uniforms was more important than camouflaging. The development of longer range, more accurate rifles began to necessitate the need for camouflage clothing. During the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 63, the British aligned rifle company Rogers Rangers adopted green uniforms. They proved to be so effective that British rifle regiments continued using green uniforms during the Napoleonic Wars. By the start of the First World War, many militaries had adopted khaki or drab uniforms as their standard dress. The war saw the need for camouflage quickly develop. Artillery pieces were painted in contrasting bold colours to obscure their shape and outlines. The French invented the first camouflage netting, which became popular for hiding machine gun positions and bunkers. Today, camouflage needs to contend with a number of threats. Larger and better optics allow for spotting over much greater distances than in the past. Camouflage materials need to be able to block or reduce infrared and thermal imaging capabilities. And camouflage now needs to hide you from drones and satellites above. You can see how camouflage and its importance has rapidly developed over the past 200 years or so. So now, let's take a look at the principles of camouflage. There are six principles of camouflage taught in most First World militaries today. They are shape, silhouette, shadow, spacing, shine, and movement. These are often remembered with a mnemonic device, such as five snakes and a mole. I'll give a brief description of what each of these principles is, but I won't try to get into this in too much detail here. Each of these will be a lot easier to understand and make a lot of sense in how they mesh together as we go through this presentation and talk about examples of camouflage. First is shape. The shape of people and man-made objects is very distinct. Nature very rarely has geometric shapes, hard lines, or continuous curves. But man-made stuff, especially military hardware, tends to have quite a lot of this. The straight line of the side of a vehicle, the continuous perfect roundness of a helmet, geometric angles of a firearm. Camouflaging requires effectively breaking up or hiding the shape of objects. Next is silhouette. Silhouettes are very distinct and they're especially obvious against the sky when you move over the top of a ridge or a hill, or maybe as a plane flying through the air. So you need to always be aware of the silhouette and how you move around in an environment and ensuring that you don't silhouette yourself. Like with shape, it's important to break up a silhouette and make it less distinctive. In an urban environment, silhouettes can be seen when standing on top of or peering over the edge of buildings. Standing at a window, especially when lights are on inside, creates a distinct silhouette. So these are all factors to remember and avoid. Up next is shadow. Shadows and understanding how to use them is a critical factor in effective camouflaging. Being in direct sunlight makes you easier to spot, but also objects that are bright can still be seen easily in shadows. Paint or other materials are often used to brighten shadowy parts of objects and darken otherwise bright parts. This can help to camouflage objects and help them blend in. Then we have spacing. Nature doesn't have consistent spacing, everything is random. Humans tend to like orderly spacing, and the military even more so. Human brains are particularly attuned for pattern recognition. So when trying to effectively camouflage, you need to always be aware of spacing. For example, an infantry patrol might be moving with 5 meter spacing in between each of them. This way they can reduce the effectiveness of explosives used against them. But this repeating 5 meter pattern is more obvious to the human brain and can be spotted more easily. Next up is shine. Shiny things attract attention. The glint from a watch, vehicle window, or phone screen, even surfaces you wouldn't normally consider shiny can be very obvious when you're trying to camouflage. For example, smooth paint on a rifle or the side of a vehicle can appear shiny, 
anything too smooth will look shiny compared with nature. Camo paint, textiles like backpacks or armor, as well as water bottles and cooking equipment. So to effectively camouflage, reducing the shininess is always important. And then finally, we have movement. Human eyesight is heavily movement dependent. Sit still and you'll be able to notice even small movements in your peripheral vision. But on the other hand, if you're moving around, you'll greatly reduce your own ability to notice movement in your field of vision. Effective camouflage often means that you need to stay as still as possible or reduce the enemy's ability to see any of your movement. It's important to keep in mind when thinking about camouflage that the size and shape of the object, as well as where you're trying to camouflage it, are crucial factors in determining at what distance it can be spotted regardless of camouflage. That's to say, there's no camouflaging a battleship even when it's tens and tens of kilometers from the enemy. It's just too big and it's in an environment that's too flat and empty. But a single infantryman can go undetected in dense foliage just meters away from a would-be observer. This is a crucial and often misunderstood part of camouflaging. It can't make something invisible. That's impossible. Rather, it's used to make it harder for an enemy with a longer effective engagement range from spotting you before you're ready to be spotted. This might be to completely avoid that enemy ever engaging you, or it might be to draw the enemy in closer so that they are within your own engagement range so you can fight back or ambush them. Let's try an example scenario to make this clearer. You're now the commander of a tank in an armored unit. Congratulations, commander. You and the other tank crews in your unit know that the enemy are looking for you, and you also know that they've got some long range weapon systems that mean that they can hit you from further away than your own guns can reach. If you and the other tanks of your unit were to park out in a field in the open, it wouldn't be long before the enemy spot you from far away and start picking you off with their superior range, and you'd have no way of fighting back. But if you were to say, hide your tanks inside a tree line and then camouflage them so that they blend into the surrounding environment, well now your enemy are going to have a hard time spotting you at that greater distance. As a result, they've kept moving forward, scouting the area. Your unit is able to more easily spot them because they're moving around out there in front of you, getting closer and closer. And now they've come within range of your main guns. Now your unit is able to ambush the enemy. The attack catches them by complete surprise. They have a general sense of where the fire is coming from, it's impossible to hide the muzzle flashes and the smoke from your tank's main gun, but in the heat of battle, it's still no easy task to pinpoint exactly where each tank is and how many of them there are. Knowing all of this, the enemy unit follows counter ambush doctrine and quickly disengage your unit and fall back. Thanks to your tenacity and the effective use of camouflage, you've managed to harass the enemy and lived another day. Medals of gallantry all round, gents. So always keep in mind when talking about camouflage, the aim is rarely to make something or someone invisible from every distance and angle, but instead to make things harder to spot, to prevent an enemy who can strike from outside your own effective range from seeing you. All right, so next we're going to take a look at infantry camouflage. This is probably what most people are thinking of when someone says camouflage. Uniforms are the first step in effective infantry camouflage. No single pattern or color combination is perfect for every environment. You wouldn't want to wear desert colors in the snow, for example. So every military chooses patterns and colors that match the environment that they believe they're most likely to be fighting in. Currently, the American-designed multicam is the most adopted camouflage pattern in the world, with 10 militaries using it and more beginning adoption over the next few years. Each put their own spin on the pattern and color combination, but you can see with these example photos how effective it is in different situations. The pattern in particular helps to break up the shape of the wearer and help them to blend in with the surrounding environment. The colors used are also key to making the wearer as neutral to shadow and shine as possible, so that both in well-lit or shadowy areas, they appear flatter and blend in better. Ghillie suits are a great example of camouflage seen in popular media, often featuring snipers or crack commando teams. This is a type of 3D camouflage that helps to break up the wearer's shape and further blend them into the environment. Usually a ghillie suit is clothing or a cape covered in cloth, twine, hessian, and materials made to look like local plants. It might also be augmented with cuttings of actual plants to further help the wearer blend in. The key to a ghillie suit's effectiveness is the way it breaks up the wearer's shape and helps to blend it in with the surrounding environment. It doesn't even necessarily have to look exactly the same as whatever the user is trying to hide in. 
It just has to be similar enough and change the shape of the body so that the user isn't immediately recognizable as a human. Camouflage paint is also another important part of infantry camouflaging. Although it might seem like you just throw some green and brown colors on your face and call it a day, there's actually more to it than that. Thinking back to the principles of camouflage we covered earlier, the shape, shadow, and shine of a face are important to consider when applying camouflage paint. Taking a look at this face, we can identify some key areas. The nose and the chin are generally better lit and appear lighter, while the eyes and under the chin appear darker because shadows fall there. Also, the chin, nose, and forehead in particular might appear shiny. So lighter colors are applied underneath the chin and around the eyes to bring those shadowy areas up. Darker colors, or black, are applied to the chin, nose, and forehead to reduce the lightness of these areas. Then, patterns are applied to blend the light and the dark areas together and break up the shape of the face. Now let's take a look at land vehicle camouflage. Land vehicles present an interesting challenge when it comes to camouflage. Being on the ground and closing with the enemy, both fighting and non-fighting vehicles usually have an abundance of vegetation and terrain to aid them in camouflaging. But with so many moving parts like wheels, tracks, guns, doors, periscopes, and other optics, effectively camouflaging these parts while also ensuring that they still function as needed is quite a task. The camouflage principles of shape, shadow, and shine are particularly important when trying to camouflage vehicles. They have distinct shapes. It's pretty easy to tell if what you're looking at from a distance is a vehicle, and it might even be possible to tell exactly what type down to the make and model. For example, an American M1A1 Abrams is very distinct. Being large, they can be hard to effectively hide in useful shadows, like in bush or forested areas. And they tend to have a lot of shiny bits, like windows, headlights, optics, or parts that might have the paint worn off back to bare metal. So there's no single best way to camouflage a vehicle, but there's some techniques that, when employed correctly, are quite effective. Deployed camouflage nets can hide vehicles at a great enough distance. You can see how up close a camouflage net isn't all that great. It's very obvious and easy to see. But once you get even a few hundred meters of distance, it becomes harder to see. Imagine you're a scout trying to spot this. You don't know exactly where your enemy is, just that they're probably somewhere in that direction. If you stick your head up too much or spend too much time idly looking around, they might see you and make your day really bad. And you might even be contending with other factors like heat shimmer warping what you see through binoculars. Your optics might be scratched up because they've been in service for 20 years and now everything you see through them is kind of hazy. You can see how deploying camouflage nets and having vehicles underneath them can be effective camouflage. When deployed, camo nets also have the benefit of being fairly effective against high enough or fast enough air threats. A plane flying overhead doesn't have the time to spot nets deployed among trees, and a higher flying drone or even a satellite may not have the clarity to properly distinguish the net against surrounding plant life. It's also fairly common for tank crews and infantry fighting vehicle teams to attach sections of camouflage nets to their vehicles. At long enough range, this could potentially help hide the vehicle but it'll do less effectively because there's also areas where the net can't be attached. For example, a turret of a tank or the wheels of a truck. The goal is to break up the shape of the vehicle and make it harder to quickly tell what kind of vehicle it is. Because you need to ensure that the net isn't going to get stuck in anything that moves like wheels or the turret, attaching nets directly to the vehicle requires a little more nuance than simply deploying them and parking underneath it. It'd really suck to mess up your own ability to fight because you fixed a camouflage net on poorly and it got stuck in your wheels or tracks causing them to jam. There's also the risk of the net catching branches or other objects as you drive around, tearing it and making it less useful. So the camouflage net, while effective, can have its downsides. A common alternative is to instead just use foliage from the local environment, or to use local foliage in conjunction with attached camo nets. Branches of trees and shrubbery can be attached to a vehicle to provide a level of camouflage that effectively blends it in with native flora. This also has the benefit of breaking up the shape of the vehicle even more effectively than attaching camo nets. Remembering that one of the key principles of camouflage is shape, and that man-made shapes are particularly easy to spot. So covering a vehicle in vegetation helps to eliminate that man-made shape of the vehicle. Branches can also be attached in ways that make them stand up, helping to hide the height of the vehicle and also make it harder to spot from above. Foliage attached to the sides help to hide tracks or wheels as well as make the vehicle appear wider. Now let's take a look at one of the more weird and wacky takes on camouflage. 
Naval camouflage has gone through a couple of iterations over time. There are some examples of ancient ships being painted a similar colour to the ocean in order to try and help them blend in. And some pirates during the 18th and 19th century were known to do something similar. But a much weirder take on naval camouflage occurred during World War I. German U-boats had become an ever-present threat to British ships. And none of the British attempts at using camouflage to hide the ships had been very effective. So, they went in a radical direction. Instead of trying to hide their ships at sea, they drew attention to them. Dazzle camouflage was developed to confuse the enemy when they spotted a British ship. Bold contrasting patterns were painted on the ship. Bright colours were used where the superstructure cast shadows, and darker colours were used where a ship would normally be bright or shiny. So by playing on these principles of camouflage, they were able to effectively break up the apparent shape of their ships, and by doing this, make it confusing when anybody observed the ships, and harder to judge what direction the ship was going, how large it might be, what speed it was going. With these patterns, the rear of a ship could be made to look like the front, or from the side, a ship might look a lot smaller than it was, or look like multiple ships. The hope was that this misdirection would cause U-boats to maneuver into the wrong positions and unable to accurately launch torpedoes at them. See, at the time, German U-boats were a lot slower when they were traveling underwater than the ships that they were targeting. So if the U-boat moved into the wrong position or its first torpedo salvo missed, it was unlikely that it would have time to adjust position to fire accurately on the British ships. This way, the British ships would get a chance to escape. One British officer's account of spotting a friendly ship with dazzle camouflage was quoted as saying, It was not until she was within half a mile that I could make out she was one ship, not several, steering a course at right angles, crossing from starboard to port. The dark painted stripes on her afterpart made her stern appear her bow, and a broad cut of green paint amidships looked like a patch of water. The weather was bright and visibly good. This was the best camouflage I have ever seen. But the program was abandoned at the end of uh, World War I because once ship-based radar became commonplace, dazzle camouflage effectively became useless. And now finally, we'll take a look at aircraft camouflage. Like with ships, aircraft are pretty hard to camouflage. But during World War II in particular, some attempts were made. You might be familiar with the distinct two-tone look of planes during the Second World War. This is called countershading. The underside of the aircraft is painted to match the sky. This way, ground forces looking up had difficulty spotting the plane. And the top was painted to match the ground or ocean below, to counter enemy aircraft looking down from above. Fighters and bombers tasked with night operations were painted with black undersides by both German and British air forces early on in the war. But each quickly found that this actually made their aircraft more obvious against the night sky. So over time, lighter shades were developed. The German Luftwaffe painted the underside of their planes in a light grey to match the sky glow from German cities at night. Plane camouflage, like naval, was largely abandoned by the end of the war, and has rarely been used since. With the invention of over-the-horizon radar and weapon systems, a pilot being able to see enemy aircraft has become irrelevant. Although, some arguments could be made for camouflage being reintroduced today. With the rise of infantry piloted drones being used for scouting and directing fire missions, having camouflage patterns on top of grounded planes along with their storage areas could prove useful. This photo from 1972 of fighters in Thailand is a good example of this. Imagine your infantry scouting the area and you've just deployed your small commercial drone to go flying around and try to find targets that you can then direct fire missions onto. You're probably flying the drone 100, maybe 200 meters above the airfield. These aircraft at that height would be pretty hard to spot. So although there might not be much case for aircraft camouflage in the air, it might now have a use on the ground. By now, you should have a pretty good grasp of what camouflage is and techniques used to effectively camouflage. Today in this video, we've talked about the history of camouflage, the principles of camouflage, and then infantry, land vehicle, naval, and aircraft camouflage. Hopefully you found this presentation useful or interesting. If you have any topics you want us to cover in the future, suggest them in the comments. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching.